Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and today I'd like to ask the question, is it possible for an astronaut to orbit the space station? Now, as you know, according to physics, everything with mass generates gravity. So even an astronaut would feel a small tug due to the gravity of the space station or whatever spacecraft they were floating along next to. So it's natural to ask the question, is it possible for an astronaut to therefore orbit the space station? Or indeed, could the space station pull back an astronaut that had floated away from it? Now in Kerbal Space Program, the parts don't actually produce self-gravity, unless you have a mod for that, of course. But uh, I do have this fantastic thing called Universe Sandbox, which does proper n-body calculations. Now you've probably seen this where you can have planets orbiting planets and smashing into planets and things like this, but it also has rather more mundane sized objects. Now as it happens, I don't have the International Space Station in here. I do have the third stage of the Saturn V or a mysterious police box. And it's very easy to take two of these items and just make one orbit the other. I mean, the truth is, as you get further and further away, the shape gets less and less important. So we might as well just go for nice, comfortable, spherical masses for testing these things. Say, uh, this bowling ball. So I can have this bowling ball with a, a dice just sitting there, orbiting it just fine. Gravity works even at this scale. With a semi-major axis of about half a meter, the orbital period is about 24 hours. So in theory, it is possible for an astronaut to orbit the space station because of its 400 ton mass. However, the space station is in low Earth orbit. And when I take this uh, magnificent bowling ball and place it in low Earth orbit, suddenly the orbits around it aren't so stable anymore. Now the gravity field of the bowling ball hasn't changed, but what has changed is that one side of the orbit is closer to the Earth and feels slightly more uh, acceleration. The other side is slightly further, so the whole, uh, the whole orbit is getting pulled and stretched by the tidal forces of the Earth. And to be clear, it's not the absolute acceleration due to gravity uh, that the Earth is generating, it's the difference, the tidal effect from one side of the orbit to the other. Now, if we really did want orbits around our bowling ball moon, we would have to move it further away from the Earth. And if we move it far enough out beyond geostationary orbit, there are, uh, there are stable orbits at this distance. So let's go back to Kerbal's space program. As I said, the planets there provide the gravity and they all have spheres of influence. That's the distance in, in Kerbal Space Program where the gravity of that particular celestial body takes over. Now in Kerbal Space Program, they're interested in the distance at which the patched conic approximation becomes more relevant to one body versus the other. And uh, they calculate this by dividing the mass of the small moon by the mass of the primary body and then raising this to the power of two fifths. But if you really want to answer the question of how close do you have to be for an orbit to be stable, you have to use a different calculation, something called the Hill Sphere. And the way I like to think about this is you imagine your satellite and it has a gravity well. And that uh, the particle that's orbiting it is sitting low down inside of this gravity well. Now to escape it has to climb up the sides and actually the least energy way out is over the L1 point that sits between the parent and the satellite. So the Hill Sphere calculation is mostly an approximation of this. The way you calculate it is you take the semi-major axis of your uh, satellite orbit and you multiply it by the cube root of the mass of the satellite divided by the mass of the primary and also divide the whole thing by three. So if you plug in the values for Earth's moon, then you get out a hill sphere which is about 60,000 kilometers across. Now I should point out actually that this is like a theoretical maximum and realistically for long-term stability, you need a half to a third of that distance. So less than 20,000 kilometers, the object should be stable. Look at this simulation here, we have a small cluster near the moon and as we travel around the ones further away do actually get pulled off. It's also worth pointing out that objects on retrograde orbits are actually more stable. 
But what about the International Space Station? Well, let's say that it masses about 400 tonnes and is in a 400 kilometre orbit and therefore its uh, semi-major axis is 6,800 kilometres. Well, in that case, you get a hill sphere radius of 1.9 metres. So that is smaller than the space station and therefore it's not possible to have any stable orbits around it. Now, if you could take the space station and squish it down, you would have to make it twice as dense as the densest material known to fit 400 tons into a 1.8 meter sphere. So if you actually had a sphere of solid osmium, the densest material we know, you still couldn't orbit it if it was in low Earth orbit. You would have to go out to about seven or 8,000 kilometers before the hill sphere was outside this physical sphere of very dense metal. Now, if you remember, this is related to tidal forces, and there's another kind of radius that you need to be concerned with when you're talking about planets, and that is, of course, the Roche limit, right? The distance at which satellites held together by gravity will be torn apart. And Universe Sandbox actually simulates this. Here we can watch Saturn's moon of Enceladus getting torn apart by the gravity field of the Earth. Now, the Hill Sphere kind of represents the distance at which objects with enough energy to orbit will probably get pulled away, but the Roche lobe size is essentially the distance at which things that are sitting still on the surface will get pulled off, stripped off by the tidal forces, so it's actually slightly bigger. And let's be clear here, we're talking about things that are held together by the force of gravity. Most uh, everyday objects that we see are, of course, held together by uh, electromagnetic forces. Chemical bonds are actually quite strong. That's why astronauts don't get torn apart by tidal forces in orbit. However, there exists gravity fields with sufficiently strong tidal forces to tear even those bonds apart. And there, you definitely do not want to get close to. Things like black holes and neutron stars will probably rip you apart before you get close to the surface. But that is not nearly the most dramatic thing that can happen when orbiting bodies get tidally disrupted. When binary stars grow old and die, it's possible that one becomes a white dwarf first, and then eventually it will tidally disrupt its neighbour and start pulling material off it onto itself. And as its mass grows, when it hits the Chandrasekhar limit of about 1.4 solar masses, then we get to see one of the biggest fireworks displays in the galaxy. The White Dwarf explodes as a supernova, specifically a Type 1a supernova. The nice things about Type 1a supernova is that it happens always at the Chandrasekhar limit. Therefore, it's very easy to know exactly how much energy is being released. And if you know exactly how much energy is being released, then you can figure out exactly how bright it is. You can use Type 1a supernovas in distant galaxies to figure out just how far away they are. And so we started out with the question of whether an astronaut could orbit the space station and ended up with a process which seeds heavy elements throughout the universe. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.